Welcome to the Who's Left podcast, a show about Indiana politics, history, and culture from the unapologetic perspective of the Hoosier left. My name is Scott Aaron Rogers, and I'm recording from Bloomington. After spending the beginning of December zooming out and looking at big picture issues, last week we brought things back to my own state assembly district with Pastor Thomas Horrocks, Democratic candidate for House 62. Today, I want to zoom back out just a little to focus on a statewide issue. Today, we will talk about the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, the semi-governmental agency, and their LEAP Research and Innovation District near the city of Lebanon in Boone County, about 30 miles northwest of Indianapolis. According to the IEDC, quote, LEAP stands for Limitless Exploration Advanced Pace. The Indiana Economic Development Corporation has acquired control of more than 9,000 acres in Lebanon and Boone County that are ready to parcel for manufacturing or R&D facilities or corporate campuses. Modeled after the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, in the heart of the Midwest in Indiana, the LEAP District will be a hub of global innovation and a key component of Indiana's plan to attract and retain businesses that keep Indiana one of the top states in the nation in which to do business. End quote. The Leap District sits squarely in the middle of the so-called hard tech corridor. This 65-mile stretch of Interstate 65 is bounded on one end by the 460-acre Purdue Discovery Park District, which, according to the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, is, quote, designed to be a futuristic smart community that will serve as a lab-to-life case study of the latest autonomous technologies, end quote. I'm sure the 15-minute city's conspiracy theorists will have a field day. On the other end of the corridor sits 16 Tech, a, quote, fast-growing network of dynamic spaces, programming tenants and partners that are creating an ecosystem where bold ideas and emerging enterprises can thrive. The 50-acre complex is on the west edge of downtown Indianapolis and includes a 5G laboratory and facilities housing a variety of makers, high-end manufacturers, and cutting-edge restaurateurs, end quote. Dynamic, bold, cutting-edge, corporate buzzwords. Back in Boone County, the Leap District is already home to an anchor tenant, Indianapolis-based pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly, uh, and their $3.7 billion research and manufacturing campus. Currently under construction, the site consists of two manufacturing facilities which will focus on production of pharmaceutical ingredients and cell and gene therapy. According to their own pamphlet, quote, what other businesses are looking to locate in the LEAP Research and Innovation District? There is a great deal of interest from future-focused businesses in the LEAP District, while the IEDC can't confirm or disclose details of active negotiations. End quote. This already sounds kind of secretive and sketchy, but most controversially, the IEDC wants to build a pipeline from the Wabash Alluvial Aquifer in Tippecanoe County near Lafayette to the Lebanon area to, quote, ensure the site can and will be able to support future investors as well as current and future residents and business owners in the surrounding area, end quote. Now look at that quote. Look at who comes first, investors and business owners, you know, for the close, to reiterate the primacy of capital in this entire endeavor, and an imaginary future residence, right? Well, what gets less consideration are the concerns of current residents up and down the Wabash who depend on the river for their very lives. We take water for granted. According to the UN, 26% of the world's population doesn't have access to safe drinking water, and 46% lack as, uh, access to basic sanitation. Be grateful every day for the marvel that is modern water infrastructure, 
the civil engineers, architects, and bureaucrats responsible for its construction, maintenance, and administration, and that you and I won the birth lottery to have grown up in a time and place where these things are a given. These are the little things folks forget about when they seek to tear down the whole system or ask what good are the experts. Look at Flint, Michigan or Jackson, Mississippi to see the horrors of poor water system management by quote-unquote business-friendly Republicans. You start fucking with people's water, shit gets real, real fast. To get the full picture on how the proposed pipeline will affect communities on the Wabash, I talked to Dr. David Sanders. One of our earliest guests on the pod, Dr. Sanders, is an associate professor of biological sciences at Purdue University. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Yale College in Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry and his Ph.D. in Biochemistry from UC Berkeley. In 1995, he joined the Markey Center for Structural Biology at Purdue. The author of two U.S. patents on novel gene therapy delivery techniques, Dr. Sanders' work on the Ebola virus led to his participation in the U.S. Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Biological Weapons Proliferation Prevention Program. Often invited to speak on ethics, biodefense, evolution, gene therapy, vaccination, and influenza viruses in public forums, Dr. Sanders is a National Science Foundation Career Award recipient and an American Cancer Society Research Scholar. Additionally, Dr. Sanders has served on the West Lafayette since he count, uh, City Council since 2016, most recently winning re-election this November. Before my interview with Dr. Sanders, I am once again asking for your financial support. The best way to contribute is with a paid subscription at scottaaronrogers.substack.com. While you're there, you can find my campaign finance research, essays, and previous episodes of the podcast. Even if your budget doesn't currently support a paid subscription, you can help by sharing this content with your friends, family, and fellow Hoosiers. <clears throat> if you use Apple Podcasts or another such platform, please rate and review this helps the algorithm deliver the Who's Left podcast to new listeners. And, whether you use Apple, Spotify, iHeart, or another service, subscribe to have new episodes delivered directly to your feed. 2024 uh, is going to be an intense, unpredictable, trying year in politics. I intend to be with you every step of the way. Chip in if you can. Thank you. Now, the man in the hat. Dr. David Sanders. Dr. David Sanders, welcome back to the Who's Left podcast. Great to have you. Glad to be here. So, I understand that the uh, IEDC is sponsoring or, or, or promoting something called a LEAP district in Lebanon or near Lebanon, Boone County, and that they want to pump a lot of water from up in your neck of the woods in West Lafayette down there in order to do this. So that's sort of my basic headline understanding of the situation. Um, give us some, some details. Absolutely. Let's let's start. So IEDC is the Indiana Economic Development mm -hmm. Corporation. It was started, I believe, in 2005 when uh, Mitch Daniels was governor. And in essence, it is a semi-government corporation that uh, is essentially involved in marketing Indiana to corporations uh, outside Indiana so that they will set up shop here. So that's that's in essence what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, that uh, goal has shifted um, comparatively recently. They are now a real estate acquisition mm -hmm. company, and they are uh, interest. They were interested in shipping water around the state, and they are also a. Uh, tax collecting authority now. So th there has been mission creep 
uh, for the for the IEDC. So let us just talk about the Leap District. Uh, this Actually, not before, before we before we get into the Leap District specifically. Yeah, can you tell me more about the IEDC because it sounds like so. This is what a public private partnership. That that sounds like the 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 right always rails against the government picking winners and losers. That sounds like the government picking winners and losers. It absolutely is. There's no question about that. And that is why I'll just I'll come to part of the the punchline, but we'll come we'll return to it later on. That is why there is such opposition which spans the entire political spectrum uh, to this LEAP district in general, to the pipeline uh, in particular, and to the IEDC and its role in this project. So it is, in fact, picking winners and losers. And it is, um, it, instead of this sort of operation coming out of the Department of Commerce, uh, they have this corporation. Uh, there are people, so for example, the governor, and the Secretary of Commerce sit at the head of it. But there's also a, a wing of it, which is really a committee made out of um, executives of the top corporations present in, in Indiana. So unelected. Now, there have been a number of... Uh, unelected officials. Absolutely unelected. Absolutely unelected. And what's amazing is that there are distributions, there are grants to companies within Indiana coming from the IEDC. And it's frequently to the companies that are involved in the IEDC part of it. Now, they recuse themselves when the uh, vote on that grant is coming up. Uh, we all know that that doesn't make any difference uh, whatsoever. Reminds mm -hmm. me of the story of um, Mitch Daniels and his, um, his daughter. Yeah, uh, here at Purdue, um, where he they decided that they needed to um, house uh, people visiting football games, you know, returning for football games. And the only corporation that could fit the bill was one run by Mitch Daniels' daughter. Uh, they were the only one who bid on it. It was called Tiny Homes or something mm. like that. And uh, Mitch Daniels left the room when the decision was being made. Uh, and she was granted it. The, the company didn't really succeed. I think it may have gone bankrupt uh, in the interim, but that's simply wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're in the room or not in the room. Your daughter shouldn't be given, if you're the president of the university, your daughter shouldn't be given an exclusive contract uh, to work with the, with, the, with the university. That's simply, it's simply wrong. It doesn't matter whether it doesn't violate any laws, uh, whether you're in the room or not in the room. It's simply wrong. Well, in this case, uh, and this has been documented in the media comparatively recently, uh, there are numerous examples of corporations who belong to this uh, part of the IEDC who are receiving grants uh, from it. And so uh, that's uh, that's really upsetting to a lot of people that there there's this um, inside game that is being played with taxpayer money. It sounds like a great way to... Uh you know, scratch your donors back and yeah. perhaps launder money from God knows where. I don't know if laundering is ex exactly the term I would use here, but certainly it is um, allowing private corporations to benefit from uh, the government in a non-transparent um, way that has very little accountability and also looks like an inside job. So uh, it's, yeah, and, and as you say, donors, um, yes, you follow the donors, uh, follow the, the political contributions of the uh, members, and you'll have a very interesting story there uh, as well. But to bring it to uh, the leap, there's this idea of having this large, um, innovation district uh, in, it was in Boone County. The, the land was bought in Boone County. Uh, Lebanon has annexed 
uh, that territory that was bought by the IEDC. Um, and so we've been able to look at the documents about those purchases, and we are, in general, talking about uh, purchases that were at three to ten times the normal market value for those properties. Uh, the IDC was acquiring them, and they were acquiring them uh, secretly mm -hmm. through an intermediate organization that was doing it on their behalf, uh, weren't telling anybody, um, and it, you know, again, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, um, a, a marketing company, all of a sudden, a marketing corporation, all of a sudden getting involved in the, in the real estate, uh, business. Yeah. I saw, as I'm looking just briefly at the leap website, but you know, b before we got going here, the, you know, as I scroll yeah. down the, 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 the one contact person I see that is highlighted with a picture is like a marketing director. Yes. Yes. It's, it's just, it's about marketing. And the, and the funny thing is, it, they're not only now marketing to the out of state, but now they're in full marketing mode to the people of Indiana um, and just saying whatever they think will be convincing the people to let this project go forward. Well, yeah, they're, they're very that's, that's flashy website. Uh, makes it sound like a, a, oh, yes. sweet, a sweet gig. 9,000 9, acres sustainable uh you know claims about indiana's top ranked business environment which and, and innovation friendly regulatory framework which means yeah do whatever um right so it's clearly an expression of what i refer to as plutocracy mm -hmm. um which is the operating um you know the mode of operation in here in Indiana. Um, and so, but, uh, you know, it is, so the leap, yeah, the, it turns out, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they recently hired an out-of-state company to run their marketing efforts, um, you know, in a, their branding and marketing efforts. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very strange, it's a very strange situation. Well, you got to bring in the Madison Avenue guys for the big sell, you know? You know, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, marketing is an important part of, you know, life nowadays. I understand that. Uh, the problem is when the marketers uh, take control, uh, then, then you have the real problems, in my opinion. So uh, they bought up all this property, you know, paying far too much money for it, taxpayer money for it. And they did get um, Eli Lilly to be a lead a uh, participant in this in this project. So uh, Lily has committed to um, you know, billion dollars of uh, and billions of dollars of investment uh, in a, um, a new project uh, in uh, in the Leap District. Uh, and but IEDC is thinking even bigger, and even bigger means potentially attracting a semiconductor companies or um, other parts of the, you know, digital. All right. So sorry about that, Doug. Let's pick it up. We were, um, you were telling us about all these grand claims about uh, the sleep district right now. They say it's going to bring 50,000 jobs uh, to, to Boone County if it's, uh, f you know, at full build, if everything's occupied, 50,000 jobs, right? Like, uh, that, that sounds great. You know, we need, we need jobs, especially in the, the more rural parts of the state. Uh, what's, what's not to love? Well, the, me, the problem that brought us into this, um, the, the people I work with, um, my, the rest of my uh, city council and the concern from Tippecanoe County was that there was a plan to build a pipeline to bring water from aquifers that are in Tippecanoe County associated with the Wabash River uh, to supply these potential industries in Lebanon. And the reason that's important is Lebanon does not have access to abundant water. 
It has an aquifer that supplies, um, can supply some of its needs, uh, but it, not enough for a, uh, a semiconductor or other sort of, um, you know, electronics, digital uh, economy, um, uh, manufacturing. Are those uh, particularly water intensive yeah. industries? Water intensive industries, exactly. And so even, even Lilly itself is a bit of a water intensive industry. They claim that they don't need water from the pipeline, but it's not 100% certain where their water is going to come. But I want to, I want to talk about why, you know, why everybody is so con concerned. And the, what stimulated it was uh, the discussion of a uh, removal of tens of millions of gallons, probably up to approximately 100 million gallons of water a day from this aquifer that's uh, associated with the, the Wabash River. And so it's, there are all sorts of uncertainties. How does this aquifer relate to the Taze River aquifer, which is where we actually get our, our water from? Uh, what is the recharge rate of this, this aquifer? And the, what was concerning was all of these plans were made in secret. Hmm. There was no discussion with local authorities. Uh, perhaps I should just introduce myself before we go on uh, further. I'm actually a West Lafayette city councilor. So I'm one of those authorities that would have, I would have hoped would have heard about this uh, project, but we were none of us, not the, not the county commissioners, um, not our representatives. No one was told about this this project and these plans, which wow. were very far along uh, by the time that we we heard about them. So I'll just from I'll tell you a little bit of my own personal uh, involvement. When I first heard about this was the beginning of the summer this past year. And I learned about it and I asked around and said, what is there for, it sounds like a bad idea. What is there for local government uh, to do? And I was told nothing. It's all up to the state legislators mm -hmm. and so on. So I said, okay, I accepted that for a while. But then the more I thought about that, uh, the more I thought, no, we should, we should have been involved earlier. This is something that concerns us greatly. We should take some action. So the first thing that I did was actually at a city council meeting, I came to it with a gauze bandage on my nose and tape holding that gauze bandage on. So I just came in, I was wearing that, sat through all city council, nobody actually asked me about it. And then at the end of it, I started speaking about my opposition to the LEAP pipeline project. Now, most of the local officials and uh, our local state legislators were expressing their concerns and that they wanted additional studies, um, all well and good. Uh, there were some that actually expressed opposition, but really, uh, you know, I thought, no, I, I, I don't want to just, I don't want more studies. I don't want, it, you know, I'm not just concerned about this. I oppose this. And so I ex uh, explicitly stated that at the end of the meeting. And then I referred to a movie that's about 50 years old now called Chinatown. Is that, are you familiar with that movie? Does that I have there? not seen that one. Okay. All right. It's before your time. So it was with Jack Nicholson. It's a great movie. Um, and uh, Jack Nicholson is in every scene of the movie. And it's about a water steal and corruption that's associated with that water steal. No. And uh, so I referred to that uh, movie. I, you know, I spoke, I spoke about Chinatown and so on and so forth. Fine, finish up the meeting. Uh, some reporters came up to me, wanted to know about, you know, my opposition to Leap and so on. And uh, then I think one of them asked me about why I had a bandage on my nose. I said, the movie Chinatown um, don't, you know, and I, I think I mentioned it in the movie, uh, in the, and I'd have to take a look, but what happens is that, um, Jack Nicholson is looking into this corruption. Okay. And Roman Polanski is the director and he plays a bit role as a thug. 
and he comes up to Jack Nicholson and says something to the effect of, you're being kind of a nosy guy. You know what happens to nosy guys? And he cuts his nose. And so for most of the rest of the movie, Jack Nicholson has a bandage, a gauze bandage on his nose with tape over it. So I was, you know, referring, make a clear reference, and no one in the room got it. Got it. So one of the reporters said to me, oh, that, that's a prop? So I said, yeah, it's a prop. So in any case, uh, the, the TV stations who were not there that night wanted me to recreate that the next day. So I had to, uh, actually the next two days. So I had to go around with it, uh, you know, my nose taped up for the next couple of days. So my, you know, my wife was very patient and taped that up for me. And so then once I did that, all of a sudden I had a, a flood of people writing me, um, texting me, calling me, what can I do to oppose this this project? We're talking about at least five or six every single day. And so as I thought of it more, I thought we should have a formal resolution against that coming out of our city council. So I wrote a formal resolution. I referred to uh, the fact that IEDC was doing this in secret, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, uh, the fact that there's likely to be ecological and economic damages to uh, Tippecanoe County, and uh, that, and we, I forgot, we said that we firmly oppose it. Okay, passed unanimously. All of a sudden, people from other councils, town councils, city councils, started contacting me. Say, hey, can we have a copy of your your resolution? We want to pass a very similar one. Nice. And so it spread up and down uh, the Wabash River. So I, I'm not sure I, I, this is a complete list, but uh, Attica, Shadeland, Lafayette, Tippecanoe County, White County, Monticello, Covington, Fountain County, and just this past Monday, Terre Haute. They're way down the way. They are, but we passed yeah. resolutions uh, against this uh, against this pipeline. Ooh, it's really, it's really caught on it. Yes, yes. Still, it wasn't quite enough. People wanted to know what more can I do? What more can I do? You know, I write to your, write to the governor, write to the um, your state legislators, so and so forth. What more can I do? So I said. So I just want to point out. We, as I said, there was, you know, some other local people opposing it, uh, legislators. Uh, there were, but not, you know, not not as vigorously as, as when I, I joined the game. Uh, there were some that expressed their concern. There had been some town halls from some groups uh, where it was clear that they were opposed uh, to it, but, they, you know, they were trying to get in from, provide information. So they were very... Uh, effective and active. And there was also a Facebook page of opposition and a petition against it. All those things uh, exist. Um, initially, when the uh, when the Facebook page came out, I uh, provided some advice uh, to them, but we're not in, I'm not involved in it uh, in anymore. So in any case, I thought, you know, the town hall, it's great, brings attention. But at the end of the town hall, it's gone, right? I mean, the people the people there are just individuals who show up at a meeting and none. Very important, but I, I didn't think it was that. And the same thing with the Facebook page. You know, it's, uh, well, it's a Facebook page. Yeah. So I thought what we need is an organization to oppose this. So I called a meeting at the West Lafayette Public Library. About 75 people showed up. I had a list of 10 tasks that I needed volunteers for. And up went the hands. People were volunteering for these tasks. All of a sudden, out of nothing, we had an organization. Beautiful. And this organization has been incredibly uh, effective. I've got the most wonderful volunteers. They are you know, intelligent, motivated, committed, uh, working together. It's been fantastic. We have a website. Uh, stopthewatersteel.org. Oh, by the way, uh, the assembled group uh, voted for that name. Um, and so that's the name that we have. We try to do it, you know, as much um, involving as many people as possible. We've had letter writing, but 
we've been um, you know very effective. Uh, the Stop the Water Steal was on the front page of the Indianapolis Star last week. Uh, the governor has had to twice respond to the questions from Stop the Water Steal, you know, on on TV. Uh, they were asked directly about our, our questions um, on TV. We've had, uh, and it's changed the whole conversation. The IEDC wouldn't comment on this enough. There was complete radio silence, nothing. Um, and uh, the governor, absolutely nothing. All of a sudden, the governor is... Uh, Discussing the issue, the governor is, he took the authority for the study. There's a study to try to see about the suitability of the aquifer to supply mm. uh, Lebanon. I mean, of course it's going to find that oh, there's right. enough water. I'm saying that there's enough water. So the, the study is going to find that, but the study is going to be inadequate. Well, who's doing, under, yeah, in doing this water. study? It seems like that's something that like maybe Purdue would be capable of doing. It's an outside company called Intera. Um, they've done a number of the studies in the the state uh, of Indiana. I'm not, you know, not my role to uh, question, you know, their integrity or uh, ability to do the job. That's not the point. The point is that the sorts of studies that they have conducted and that they are um, purportedly supposed to be conducting are completely inadequate mm. for answering the questions. Um, there is, there's actually a uh, a toxic waste dump uh, going back decades that's not too far from these aquifers, and people are concerned that if you start drawing water away, um, that it's going to draw the contaminants into uh, the water. Uh, I mean, there are just so many different, and you can't know that until you're doing the full project. What they were doing a test where they took three million gallons a, uh, a day for a couple of days and put it right back. And they say, oh, it's, it's fine, everything's fine. Um, but people locally were reporting sulfur smells in their water, silting up of their wells, and they didn't know why it was happening, but they, they traced it particular days to when the testing was occurring. Suspicious. And apparently, yes, apparently IDC um, and uh, this company was completely unaware uh, of these of these problems. So uh, this group who stopped the water steal has been incredibly effective along with all those other uh, groups in bringing this uh, to people's attention. And I argue that the focus on IEDC and its conflicts of interest uh, wouldn't have arisen at this time if it weren't for the efforts of all the people who are opposed to the pipeline. And there was just a report on Monday of this week I guess that's yesterday, uh, from the Citizens Action Coalition about this project. Uh, excellent report. And they also come out very strongly uh, against it and a call for the IEDC to be reined in. Uh, one of the things that is very troubling about this project is in 2022, the state legislature um, passed something, I think it is uh, SEA 361, uh, 2022, it not only exempts the property that the IEDC has purchased from uh, taxes, but any of the incremental taxes from the district, they don't go to the city, they don't go to the county, they don't even go to the state treasury. They go to the IEDC. <laughs> <laughs> and um, according to the according to the uh, to the legislation, it's eighty eight percent goes to the IEDC unless there's something you know, different that's negotiated. So only twelve percent goes back. And this is uh, state income tax, property taxes, and sales taxes generated in this district. So this is completely making the IEDC unaccountable. To the state legislature, they will have a dedicated pot of money that can do whatever they want. And so it becomes, this whole thing becomes an exercise in self-perpetuation of the IEDC and not for the benefit of the taxpayer or of, you know, 
of Indiana, and certainly not for any benefit whatsoever uh, for the county where the water is being uh, taken. And and maybe, you know, maybe this thing's the bee's knees, but it would be at least great to have uh, your opinion heard in these matters. Yeah. And it sounds like the structure of the IEDC and the way it's sort of removed from the elected officials and there's this sort of fake wall between the elected officials and uh, these corporate overlords. Um, there's just a series of hoops, you know, a series of hurdles and, and it's just insulated from actual democracy. That is true. Now, technically, they are subject to APRA, um, Access to Public Records Act, but they have broad leeway to redact about anything, you know, in terms of their plans. Uh, so Sheets of black pages. That's right. That I've, we, we, we have them. I mean, we've received them. And they're just sheets of, of redacted uh, material. So, you know, the, the, the fact that they're technically um, subject to it is, is made a mockery by what actually happens, uh, in fact. Uh, I'm hopeful that the transfer, at least, of the study to the uh, IFA, which is also a, a semi-government corporation and uh, and also um, subject to APRA, but they won't be negotiating with the companies directly as the IEDC does. Hurdle. So yeah. there shouldn't be the exemptions for you know planning and you know, corporate secrets and all, and that sort of thing. I don't know, I, you know, we'll have to see what happens um, as we go forward, but I'm hopeful at least that that is uh, a step in the right direction. The other thing is the IFA has been given certain authority over water projects in the state. The um, IE, I, I'm sorry, IFA, The I, I may have misspoken, the IFA, the Indiana Finance Authority, has be, been given authority over water projects in the past. Sound like the IDC purview. has no experience. That's right. Sound sorry. like their purview at all. It was folded in. There was an independent uh, agency, and it was folded into the IFA uh, a number of years ago. So, uh, but for IEDC, they have no experience whatsoever. So they were running this uh, study and, you know, proclaiming. Or, you know what what great results it had and so on uh and they had no experience with water whatsoever so a step in the right direction you know it's i i'm not declaring victory we have a very long road to go uh, but i think the most important thing is we're not going away and we're just increasing in strength uh as time there are more and more people joining uh, if you look around um on 52 or 231 or around West Lafayette or Lafayette, you will see lots and lots of our stop the water steel signs. So what's the... Uh, we can't... Uh, yeah, go ahead. We, we can't make enough of them. They're, I mean, they people are just uh, snapping them up. Uh, very, yes, very quickly. So what is the current status of the LEAP project? Is it um, still blueprints uh or you know artist renderings or are there shovels in the ground so for the for the you know the, the companies that they want to recruit there's nothing happening there there is um movement to, in the for Eli Lilly uh and they have purchased all of this land now IEDC until the pressure built on them would not comment at all about the Lee project. I mean, they were approached by the, the media repeatedly, complete nothing. We would ask them to come to Tippecanoe County, the various organizations like the League of Women Voters, um, some of these town halls. You know, they eventually sent a brand new PR person uh, to speak at a meeting. I'm sorry to say, I, I really felt sorry for him. He 
had nothing to contribute. He was brand new in the job. He was thrust in the middle of a controversy. Uh, didn't really have anything uh, to add. But now, I'm sorry, now the IEDC is actually uh, addressing things. And one of the things that they've said, which is really interesting, is that if we do not recruit a semiconductor company or you know some large user of water, we won't build the pipeline. I see that as a positive step, uh, a positive admission, uh, because one of the foci of our efforts is to increase the reputational cost to any company that would come to this project and requires the water from uh, these aquifers. I think that there is such community outrage again it goes across the political spectrum this is not a partisan issue it is clearly political yeah. right because it's talking about the people and their government it's political but it is not partisan and we want to make sure that uh, any company that would potentially come would understand that uh they are coming over the vehement objection by the uh, the company, the, the by the community. And this community isn't just Tippecanoe County. I mean, we're talking about a lot of people in Boone County, but people up and down uh, the Wabash River. And furthermore, there has been discussion, what are they going to do with the water after uh, they have taken 100 million uh, gallons a day? They are not talking about recycling it. They're talking about it dumping it somewhere. Some of the discussion has been they're planning to dump it in Eagle Creek. And, well, that's bad for that uh, ecosystem. It doesn't want an intake of 100 million uh, gallons a day. Yeah. Uh, there were some other questions, like just in the short term, where are they going to get the water for the lily? Well, now they're the, the, the Citizen Action um, Coalition a report suggests that they may be getting it from Hamilton County. Uh, so these are important issues that are affecting a large part of Indiana. So go ahead with your question. They, did they not think about this ahead of time? Like we're gonna we're gonna build this giant thing in the middle of a damn cornfield. There's no water anywhere near it or not nearly enough, why Why isn't it near a greater water source? You know, I hear there's uh, old, old dirty industry coming offline up on Lake Michigan. They would probably love to have an, uh, a, a semiconductor plant up there. Well, so you're asking two questions. One is... Didn't they realize that there were going to be these problems? And the second one you're asking, uh, I guess, is why Lebanon? So I'll take the first, the second one first. Why Lebanon? Uh, I'm just going to mention things that are other people have said. Uh, I'm not endorsing them, uh, but they're you know they're they're publicly available. Uh, the mayor of Lebanon, who I have heard. Uh, he is, you know, intelligent, well-spoken, seems like a real, you know, nice guy. Um, he is the son of a person who uh, run, ran or runs a Republican consulting uh, group called Market Red. And they take credit for making uh, Indiana a one-party state. Uh, supermajority, uh, all the state offices, uh, so on and so forth. Oh, well, I don't know if so, I take credit for this, but hey. You know. Well, they, <laughs> they're they a very, very well-connected um, yeah. Republican uh, family. Uh, and it's it's all documented. If you looked online, you could, you could find, you know, where people have discussed this. So that is one of the, the questions. Now, they're trying to justify Lebanon as... Um, well, it's between Indy and Purdue, and the property is cheaper in uh, Boone County than it is Tippecanoe County. Uh, I Not if you pay for it ten times more than it's worth. Exactly. Exactly. 
and and you know the econo the ecological uh, damage is something that just doesn't figure into their uh, calculations. So, um, you know, whatever whatever the reason is, it seems to be insufficient. And now they're saying, oh, you know, Central Indiana is there's, there's a long term problem with water in Central Indiana. You know what? I agree. There's there's a long term problem using 100 million gallons a day, you know, for semiconductor plants in a place that doesn't have water is not a solution to that problem. It doesn't even bring us on the, in the direction of a solution to the problem. It's, it's actually, it would exacerbate the problem. Um, but never mind uh, the, the problems for our electrical grid, uh, which are also something you should, you know, take a look at uh, in the future. Our electrical grid in Indiana is, is just poised at the, at the edge of uh, of not being functional, but another ish, another day, another <laughs> another time. Uh, so the other question is, and and you know what, I don't have an answer to your first question because people are sort of evenly divided. Some people think they knew all the time, and this was their plan, and they thought nobody would notice and nobody would care and nobody would you know raise their voices and they they just get along with it. The other people. Uh, the other 50% say they went along into this project, you know, Lebanon, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they realize, oh, my goodness, we don't have any water. Uh, where are we going to get it from? And so they started hunting uh, oh, yeah, for that. Go, I don't know which is true. <laughs> I don't know which is true. I think there's some expression like never s assume malice when stupidity is sufficient or incompetent. <laughs> yes, yes. Sufficient explanation. Um, but I, I simply don't know. What I do know is once they realized it was a problem, they didn't communicate it uh, with us. They did everything in secret, and they, for a long time, assumed that any sort of opposition would be, you know, minor, uh, of short duration, uh, in in effect. Just an old hand you sweep them under uh, the rug, yeah. right? That's right. And just ignore them. I mean, they they simply weren't responding uh, to anyone, and so they created a, a vacuum. Now, the problem when you, when you create a vacuum is that um, you know rumors start, and some information uh, that is not fully vetted, it's not fully out of it, sometimes invades the the space. But that's again, uh, that's the fault of people not telling us what the actual information is, right? If you if you don't, you know, if you pump out uh you know you, you well you pump out all the the water you're going to suck in something else and so uh by not communicating uh by not addressing these in a forthright fashion we have a right to know uh they they created a situation where um there is some you know there is some exaggeration and, and false now we for our group um, I really try to stay away from that. Focus on the actual uh, facts. I'm sure we're all going to make mistakes, but we're not we're not interested in blowing this out of proportion. We want to focus on uh, you know actual data. We we want to be a repository for information. And this again, when you're talking about social media or so on, things get posted. Much of it, which is true and accurate and important, not taking away anything from it, but it's not in an organized uh, in an organized uh, arrangement, you cannot. If you want, if you're looking for it, it's hard to find, right? We we are going to be a place, and we're beginning already developing that at our website. Which you know, this is a very young organization. We've uh, we just celebrated our two month um, anniversary very, today. Yes. Uh, but we've come a tremendous way in that very uh, short time. Again. Due to the not due to me, due to my, the volunteers who are working uh, with the um, with the organization, they're doing a fantastic job. And uh, but you know we're we're going to continue to uh, push forward to be a repository for information, for what you can do, uh, for legislation, for uh, also personal stories. We'll have them in a collected area. We've already been connecting the media with people who've been personally affected. That's part of what we do. 
Uh, we also have been gathering allied uh, organizations that are working with us, uh, you know, on, on, on our opposition. And uh, we, uh, they're providing us advice. We provide them uh, some advice about uh, the successes that we have been uh, able to achieve. And but we're also trying to uh, collate the letters that people are sending out and the responses they get from legislators. And I think this is very important because most of the time when people write to their legislators, first they, you know, they get a form letter or we'll get, mm -hmm. but it just disappears, right? That person gets it. That's it. What we're going to be doing is to be publishing these responses so people know where they stand on these issues and whether they're responding to their constituents uh, and whether they're taking uh, the matter seriously. So those are all sorts of things. And they're all, it's all a work in progress. But um, I'm very excited about what, uh, what the team has been able to achieve and what they're uh, committed and motivated to achieve in the future. So um, what's, uh, what's the website? Where can people find out more information about your organization? Sure. It's called Stop thewatersteel.org. So stop the water steel is one word, uh, dot org. And uh, if if, and, if you are in an uh, area affected by this or you just have strong feelings about it in any way, uh, what uh, should our listeners do? Well, writing their legislators, but not only their legislators, but for example, the legislators who are... Um, in charge of the General Assembly, um, Senator Bray and uh, Speaker of the House Talon Houston, because they're going to make the decisions about whether legislation could, should go forward and so on. One of the things, we just put out a press release today uh, calling for the repeal of 361-2022, which is the measure that creates these innovation uh, development districts where the tax revenue <laughs> goes to the IEDC. Uh, this, I, I, you know, I don't know whether the legislature really knew, uh, you know, fully understood the implications of this, but I think it has created a uh, a situation where the IEDC sees itself as not having to be accountable uh, to the state legislature. They were going to have their, you know, an independent pot of money. Uh, that they can play with as they choose. Uh, so uh, we're, we're calling uh, we're calling for that, and I would encourage people, strongly encourage people, to call for the repeal of uh, of that because I think that would be an important step in reining IEDC in. But uh, if you want to buy a sign, you can buy the uh, the stop the water steel signs. Uh, people, it, we, it's it, it's decreasingly it's yeah it's decreasing in um being common to write letters to the editor i encourage people to do that uh we've already had some of our allies in in boone county they've been writing uh letters to the editors that have been published um actually as op-eds uh, around the state so you can have that uh effect and there's still plenty of newspapers that will publish uh, letters to the editor. And so I would encourage people uh, to write them. They're very, they're very effective and brings, uh, brings attention. Uh, if you're living in a uh, municipality that has not yet had a resolution, contact your counselors and, or your mayor and say, you know, we should be opposing this as well. Uh, or, you, or your county commissioners, we should be opposing this uh, as well. Uh, another thing is, in general, we don't have a water management agency uh, in the state of Indiana. We don't have any sort of stra water strategy, some long-term planning, nothing. And our neighboring states, some, uh, uh, you know, Ohio, for example, they, they have such uh, bodies. So people should be advocating for that and asking for um, asking for 
uh, that sort of body, you know, planning and that sort of agency uh, to be created, just focused on on water for the long term needs of human beings. And that's another thing that's I think important to to point out. If we were talking about just you know, uh, for example, that we needed to move the water to supply human beings, right? In Indianapolis, for example, I don't think the opposition would be nearly as strong. Right. Right. This is they are specifically recruiting a, a company to an area that has no insufficient water and they want to take the water. That's what's really galling about this, this whole thing. Uh, but I know we, we will face water challenges, but we should address them in a in a comprehensive, organized, transparent fashion, bringing stakeholders who live in the affected areas into the conversation. That's what should happen. Uh, and so uh, that's and then the final thing. The final thing is that uh, people outside of the Wabash River should realize that uh, the IEDC and these issues about water are going to affect them in the very near future uh, as well. And that if we don't, as citizens, take back control of the government and have you know more transparency, more accountability, uh, they're gonna be facing the same thing uh, as well. And so, uh, Again, they need to be they need to be advocating with their local legislators, with their local officials about, uh, you know, stopping this and giving local governments more control over their their fates. I'll just mention as an aside uh, at this last city council meeting. uh, We passed again unanimously a resolution opposing state preemption of local legislation. Now, this is something that yes. uh, happens in a number of states, but it's it's a big common deal in Indiana where outside of the state forces who want to impose some sort of business-friendly business uh, legislation on the entire state, mm-hmm. they prevent local uh, government from regulating uh, different things, whether it's container laws, or puppy mill, uh, plastic bag. Yes, but that, well, that's that's the one. That is exactly the one. So, so the, it's funny you mentioned. So that's exactly what happened. So, uh, West Lafayette, Lafayette, and the county, Tippecanoe County, all passed a ban. Now there weren't any in West Lafayette or Lafayette, but uh, in order for these ordinances to go through, these you know um, they bring us all together uh, to do it. And there was one out in the county. Mm. And so uh, we all came out and, you know, we don't, we're banning them. Well, the puppy mill industry is convincing the state legislature to create a preemption law uh, that was going to um, nullify. There's no uh, puppy mill lobby. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. For the puppy mill lobby. My God! Well, you'll man. see who sponsors the legislation in the. Uh, you'll see who sponsors the legislation in the uh, general assembly. <laughs> oh, and so, and so, uh, yes. So they are trying to. They're trying to preempt uh, our. And that's what. That's what. Um, you know, brought this to a head, and why uh, uh, the other person who also sponsored the um, leap pipeline resolution with me, he joined me to sponsor one against uh, preemption, and that's something yeah. that I'm hoping will catch fire as well. As I've traveled around um, Indiana, and I've you know, and I've I've gone to. Um, City council and county council, county com, you know council meetings, uh, county commissioner meetings uh, around the state. Uh, when you talk about state preemption, it it, it unifies people you know in local government. Doesn't matter the party, and so uh, just like leap, I mean I, I, the these people who contacted me about it, you know, 
Many of them are Republicans. Maybe the councils are Republican, you know, councils who passed the uh, the resolution against the LEAP pipeline. Uh, I'm hoping that there will be other um, other cities, counties that oppose uh, that um, will vote for resolutions uh, opposing um, state preemption, just like just like we have. And you, I would encourage your listeners to, uh, this is a huge issue. This is a hu- huge issue. And it's always outside, uh, out of state interests, um, promoting narrow business money, uh, interests money, money. that are involved in this. Follow the money. Yes. Uh, yes. Doc, um, give the people the website one last time. Absolutely. It's stopthewatersteel.org, dot O-R-G, uh, and you can, you know, sign up there for a sign. You can join the group. And that's another thing that I encourage people. If you, if you are interested in being part of the group, all you have to do is sign up, then you're part of the group. And I would encourage you when you are contacting your legislator or contacting the newspaper, Mention that you're a member of the group. It's so much powerful, much more powerful to speak as part of an organization uh, rather than just uh, as an individual. I have nothing against people speaking out as individuals, but it's um, you're taken much more seriously mm-hmm. uh, when you are part of an organization. Yeah, absolutely. We are uh, much stronger together than we are apart. Dr. David yeah. Sanders, thank you so much for uh, joining the Who's Left podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I really enjoy it, and I hope you get you know more and more listeners as time goes on. I appreciate it. Once again, that was Purdue professor and West Lafayette City Councilman Dr. David Sanders. You know, as I listened to Dr. Sanders, I kept thinking this is open, blatant corruption. So I found out more, and the entire concept of the IEDC and agencies just like it in other states is ghastly. First, the very composition of the IEDC board is a problem. All 15 board members are appointed by the governor and come from a pool of the state's wealthy business elite. Given that, it should come as no surprise that IEDC has been dogged by allegations of impropriety since its inception. Here, I will quote from a 2013 report by the group Good Jobs First. Quote, In 2005, the first bill Mitch Daniels signed as governor created the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, a public-private enterprise designed for speed and flexibility, uh, flexibility in pursuing businesses. The agency has played an increasing role in drawing new businesses to Indiana or encouraging existing firms to expand. But overall... Indiana has lost private sector jobs over the past eight years, and the IEDC has backed several troubled companies or entrepreneurs, including a special assistant to the Commerce Secretary who was accused of fraud and extortion in China. Even some of the governor's own party, having grown concerned about accountability at the highly secretive agency, proposed a bill last week aimed at making the IEDC more transparent. The star's editorial reference to fraud and extortion was to Monica Liang, who had been given a contract by IEDC to help recruit companies from China. In 2011, Chinese officials sent a complaint to Governor Daniels accusing Liang of abusing her position. She allegedly solicited what amounted to an $8,000 bribe from one company and got a Chinese businessman to wire $50,000 into her personal account. End quote. The IEDC has a history of lying about jobs numbers. This controversy first erupted in 2010 when investigative journalism by WTHR 13 Indianapolis found that many of the deals IEDC took credit for had never happened, had fallen short of job creation pledges, or had shut down. Their series, Reality Check, Where Are the Jobs?, led by reporter Bob Siegel, won an Emmy, a Peabody, and a DuPont. Only about 60% of the jobs claimed by IEDC were likely to materialize. The next governor, 
theocrat, bigot. I would do anything for Trump, but I won't do that. Mike Pence. In March 2013, signed into law a new transparency bill which addressed some issues at the IEDC. The bill made incentive agreements subject to open records requests, posted more data online in a transparency portal, required the IEDC to more accurately report both projected jobs and actual job outcomes, as well as the compliance status of recipients and whether clawbacks occurred. However, the same year, Pence tapped Eric Doden, uh, excuse me, Eric Doden, Nepo baby and current third-rate, fourth-rate gubernatorial candidate, as well as Victor Smith, self-dealing Nepo baby, both of whose fathers had donated thousands to his campaign to head the IEDC. Needless to say, the corruption continued, and here I cite the American Bridge Trump Research Book. In 2013, IEDC approved a $500,000 incentive that benefited the business interest of a board member and Pence donor, uh, James Marcaccilli. 2013, Pence donor and IEDC board appointee Angela Braley sat on the board of Lowe's as IEDC gave millions in potential incentives to Lowe's home centers. 2014, IEDC gave roughly a million dollars in taxpayer money to a major Pence donor at Deister Machine Company. Under Pence, the Development Corporation paid incentives to companies that outsourced jobs. After awarding BAE System Controls over $1.5 million in incentives, BAE they, outsourced 100 jobs. After awarding Federal Mogul Corporation nearly $70,000 in incentives, the company outsourced 92 jobs. After the Fabriform company outsourced 60 jobs, the IEDC awarded them $160,000 in incentives, and the IEDC awarded General Motors over $4.5 million in incentives, who then outsourced jobs out of Indiana. The shady behavior has continued through the administration of Pence's successor, current Governor Eric Holcomb. Just this past month, the IEDC requested hundreds of millions of dollars during a state budget committee meeting. Apparently, the funding will be used to court two advanced manufacturing projects and to expand the Lebanon Industrial District. According to WBAA Lafayette, quote, the IEDC requested $180 million for a deal-closing fund intended to help bring two advanced manufacturing projects to the state. The companies and locations that would receive those projects have not been publicly released. The IEDC is also requesting roughly $100 million more to buy more land for the Lebanon Industrial District, construct roadways, and meet other critical utility needs. End quote. These public-private partnerships like the IEDC, by their very nature, obfuscate their workings from democratic oversight. Indiana is not the only state subject to such grift. Similar public-private partnerships swindle states like Rhode Island, Florida, Wyoming, Virginia, Michigan, Ohio, Texas, and Utah. In one end of the black box goes taxpayer money, out the other end comes a questionable number of jobs. Don't ask questions about how the black box works. Just trust the process and let the important people handle it, right? Step one, taxpayer dollars. Step two, eh. Step three, jobs. Meanwhile, behind door number two, it's our elected officials, predominantly Republicans, sloppily swapping research, trade secrets, lists of customers and prospects, confidential financial disclosures, grants, loans, and tax breaks in a wet, sloppy, passionate kiss with their big business donors in some perverse game of seven minutes in heaven. Ball State economics professor Michael J. Hicks wrote, quote, The job creation numbers from economic development groups are worse than no information at all. One could have learned more about the difference in economic conditions between 2020 and 2021 from a random hermit or second grader than you could derive from the economic development data. End quote. And none of this speaks to the quality 
of these allegedly created jobs. Are they good jobs? Living wage jobs? Raise a family jobs? Union jobs? These functions used to be carried out by public agencies subject to oversight by democrat uh, democratically elected officials. I suggest we return to that model. Short of that, Good Jobs First recommends several safeguards like maximum transparency, including adherence to state open record laws, strict conflict of interest rules for staff and board members, strict rules against pay to play, and the appointment of a public ombudsman to oversee the agency. The latest on this project as we enter 2024. The water pipeline is currently on hold. Tippecanoe County commissioners slapped a nine-month moratorium on any large water exports from their county. Governor Holcomb transferred responsibility of a major water study to Indiana Finance Authority from the IEDC. Results are not expected until fall of this year. IEDC continues to be a bunch of shady fucks. From WTHR, quote, The IEDC is continuing to hide the vast majority of the records requested by 13 news, including management plans, risk assessment plans, engineering schedules, sustainability summaries, environmental impacts, project maps, and at least two dozen other documents the state agency has already commissioned and paid for. An IEDC attorney told 13 News he believes the agency has a right to withhold public documents that are considered deliberative. End quote. Later on in the article, quote, the IEDC says preliminary test results show there is ample water flow within Wabash River Aquifers to supply the LEAP project in Boone County without impacting residents or businesses in Tippecanoe County. End quote. I would not trust them. They seem committed to make this happen regardless. Keep an eye on the story. I know I will. In conclusion, like, I get it. The IEDC's mission is to attract investment and jobs to Indiana. I'm a fan of in uh, investment and jobs. These are good things. But I'm also a fan of open, transparent, people-focused government. These two goals need not exist in a state of conflict. That's all for this episode. Please subscribe, comment, and share. Holler at me on social media at ScottRodge78. Until next time, this has been the Who's Left Podcast. My name is Scott Aaron Rogers. Love each other, Indiana. Indiana.